It is with absolute pleasure that I welcome Paul Sammons via Zoom to Melbourne. Paul is a close friend and colleague who is an independent curator and educational consultant specialising in difficult histories. His work includes Auschwitz Not Long Ago, Not Far Away, a major travelling exhibition produced by the Spanish company Musilia, which presents some 700 original artefacts to new audiences in Europe and North America. Paul is also chief curator of the exhibition, Seeing Auschwitz, produced by Musealia for UNESCO and the United Nations. This powerful exhibit re-examines iconic photographs of the largest killing center in human history, challenging us to think again about what each one really reveals about that place and time. Paul worked for 10 years at the Imperial War Museum, War, War Museum in London, helping to create the United Kingdom's national exhibition on the Holocaust and developing its distinctive educational approach. He is the founding director of the Centre for Holocaust Education at University College in London. Paul served on the United Kingdom delegation to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, and that is where I first met Paul. He has consulted on numerous international projects, including currently for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as their first Leslie and Susan Gonda Foundation Fellow. Paul, we are just so honoured that you have zoomed in all the way to Australia to deliver tonight's keynote address at the annual Betty and Schmuel Rosenkrantz Kristallnacht Oration. We look forward to hearing your talk tonight on Auschwitz Artifacts as Witness. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Sue. Thank you uh, for the invitation to speak um, today and for the honour of being asked to give the Rosencrantz oration this year. Uh, it's a real privilege. Delighted to be with you. I'm going to share my screen. So, um, yes, thank you so much again for the invitation uh, to speak. As I say, it's a real honour to be with you. Uh, the theme I was going to speak to you about today is based on the exhibition that uh, Sue included in the, that kind of introduction. Um, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. This is the largest uh, exhibition, historical exhibition about the significance of Auschwitz ever curated. It's, uh, it's a traveling exhibition. It opened in Madrid a couple of years ago. Some 600,000 visitors attended. It's currently in New York City and it will uh, move next year to Kansas City. It is an exhibition of some 700 original artifacts from many of them from Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum in Poland, but also collected from and uh, from some 30 institutions and individuals around the world. Uh, so what I wanted to explore is why are artifacts such an important part of this exhibition? Uh, what is it about artifacts, uh, original items, that uh, draw the visitor so strongly, engage us in this history. I want to argue that artifacts don't give us a, a better way of understanding the past, of course, but they do give us a different way to other sources of evidence, whether that's photographs. We have some 400 archival photos in this exhibition as well. Uh, documents, of course, uh, minutes that were written, newspapers, uh, speeches that were given from the time, uh, archival film, uh, all of this is a rich kind of tapestry of how we can see and understand and interrogate the past. But there's something about original artifacts, their three dimensionality, I think. And also that these are the remnants of the past that remain with us in the present. These are the things that people owned, the things that they bought and sold, the things that they made, that they gave to each other as, as presents. There's something tangible about these physical objects that somehow link us to the people in the past. And this is what I wanted to explore uh, this evening. I was going to say this morning, here this morning, with you this evening. Uh, this, I think we'll start with one example. Um, this item appears in our exhibition, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit of the story behind it. The, the gentleman that it speaks to is a man at the time of a young man, uh, Mendel Landau, who was born in a Polish town called Oswentium, which later was to become much more infamously known as Auschwitz. Mendel Landau uh, was, after the German invasion of Poland, 
was forced into slave labor, building roads for the German Reich. Uh, after the labor had, uh, on those roads had completed, he was later sent to Auschwitz concentration camp, which was on the outskirts of, the, of his hometown. Uh, Mendel Landau was there for um, several years. In 1944, he encountered a Hungarian Jewish man who just arrived. And this man had still not been stripped of his civilian clothing. He was wearing this shirt, this undergarment. It's called a talit katan. The, uh, this is a, an item of clothing, an undergarment, an undershirt, worn by observant Jewish men. Mendel Landau was a deeply religious man himself. He was uh, keen as far as he could to retain something of his, of his life before, his identity, to keep up his faith, and of course had been stripped of everything as, as people were as they entered the concentration camps. But he encountered this man and he noticed, I can show you a little bit more closely, these fringes hanging down beneath the corners of this shirt. These are the fringes of the talit, or the talit, in this case, the talit katan, uh, which signify for Jewish religious observant men, uh, part of the uh, custom and tradition of religious observance. And he asked this new arrival if he might borrow this shirt so that he might make a blessing, so that he might fulfill a commandment from the Hebrew scriptures. The new arrival lent it to him, he removed it, he gave it to Mendel Landau, who uh, proceeded to pray. Landau was then spotted by an SS guard and beaten severely, viciously, so that he was left bloodied and battered on the ground. The uh, garment here was snatched away from him and thrown, tossed as a piece of trash in the... Uh, to the side of the camp near the wire, and the SS man moved on. Landau, as the guard moved away, then crawled over to retrieve this garment so that he could return it to its owner. The owner, having seen the violence that a garment like this brought, uh, refused to take it back and said that Landau could keep it. So a huge risk to himself. He chose to conceal this garment in Auschwitz, continued to use it there to pray. He had it on the death march uh, and when he left Auschwitz, 60,000 or so people were, were marched uh, from Auschwitz at the end of, towards the end of the war, ahead of the advancing Soviet army, many of them dying on the way. He kept it that time. He had it with him at liberation. He took it with him uh, after the war when he managed to emigrate to New York. This garment, still bears the traces of that beating. It still carries the bloodstains of Mendel Landau on it. And here we exhibit it in this exhibition. I start with this particular item, just because I, for me at least, it's a vivid uh, recollection of just how powerful um, what otherwise would be quite simple items perhaps uh, can be when we are able to uh, hang a story tell a personal story, uh, tell something of the people who owned these objects and of the experience they went through. And as the uh, survivor generation, of course, in time will pass away and we lose the first hand witnessing of the survivors. Luckily, we have uh, their recordings, we have their writings, uh, but they won't be able to continue to give their testimony in, in person. Uh, to some extent, in an exhibition like this, the items, their objects, their personal possessions carry some of the burden of that memory. And we, of course, uh, working in this field, take on some of that burden as well and, and try hard to do justice to it. So this talk will be, as I say, about mainly about artifacts and how we use them in this exhibition. The challenges, though, when we were curating the exhibition, there was a small international uh, team of of colleagues who uh, worked on this um, very intensively for a number of years, led by uh, Robert Jan van Pelt as chief curator, Michael Berenbaum, also Jamal Zaniti, um, Miriam Greenbaum, 
and uh, of course a team of designers and others, many people working hard to curate this. The challenges that we faced, uh, as do all exhibition curators, is firstly, how do you begin? What's your purpose and, and where do you start? How do you introduce this subject to your visitor? How do you then proceed? How do you attempt to do justice to the complex history that is Auschwitz and the Holocaust and how those different histories are entwined? Um, how do we leave the visitor? What do we want the visitor to take away? What should be their final impressions? Now, these are only some of those challenges, of course. I only have a short time to speak to you, so there are many, many more, but let's at least try and tackle some of these. And the starting points that we had, some guiding ideas. One of the guiding principles for us, of course, Auschwitz is intimately connected to the history of the Holocaust. And to some extent, there's a danger, there's a risk that the Holocaust becomes rather Auschwitz-centric. We did not want to reinforce that view. Uh, the, the Holocaust was much more than just Auschwitz. But Auschwitz was also not only the Holocaust. There are other stories, other uh, crimes, Nazi crimes, that are also uh, deeply entwined in that, in that history and that place. So we needed to orientate the visitor in time and place. We have this notion that the Holocaust, that Auschwitz itself, were created or happened in the modern world. This is something very relevant to us. It happened not very far away and, and not very long ago. And we also wanted to present the evidence of the mass crimes. This is a history of destruction, of course, a, a history of destruction of peoples, of murder of millions of people. Uh, in Auschwitz alone, more than one million people were murdered, but also um, it's a destruction of the evidence of those crimes or the attempted destruction by the perpetrators trying to conceal their crimes. And so the, much of this evidence that we present on pub, is on public display for the first time. Much of this is evidence of these crimes that has not really been seen before by the general public. Also, as I think you, I hope you saw in that story of Mendel Landau, through that evidence, we wanted to ensure that the voices of the victims are also present throughout. So a number of different kind of guiding principles. But still, um, how do you start? How do you begin an exhibition like this? Uh, how do you introduce the themes, the history, the significance to your visitors? And what perspective do we want them to take? This is the, the first room proper, if you like, in, in our exhibition. There's a, an earlier room which gives some maps and some orientation, some ideas, but this is the, where, the, in a sense, the history begins or the overview of that history begins. And we wanted to do that through uh, just a small number of very powerful objects, artifacts, that somehow showed a range of different kinds of uh, perspectives, different kinds of histories. So the wheel set that you see there, it echoes a very large object that we have outside of the exhibition. It's too large to fit inside. It's an original um, freight wagon from the German railway. I'll show you an image of it later on. Uh, and the wheel set, the huge wheel set you see here, uh, is one of those um, that were on the trains that uh, ran across the railway lines of Europe, uh, deporting um, Jewish people from across Europe to Auschwitz and to other camps, of course, uh, most of them to their deaths. This is a symbol for us of the perpetrator side of this story. It's a symbol not only, uh, not so much of the Nazis, of course, but rather of the society, the industry, the technology, the bureaucracy, the wider perpetrator society that was necessary in order to carry out a modern genocide. In the background a little bit of that room, further on in that room, you see a much smaller object just here, uh, a woman's dress shoe, uh, a red, single red shoe, which you can see is displayed against, on the wall, a large blow-up photograph of a mass of shoes. Image of the, of the mass of shoes, of course, echoes the mass of victims many of whom are unknown to us. Uh, this particular shoe, we don't know the woman who wore this shoe, we don't know her name, but there's something very individual about that item. Uh, we can um, imagine 
we can speculate on that she was probably a fairly young woman. She was wearing a very fashionable shoe. And we can imagine, did she dance in these shoes? Did she hold her uh, lover? Did she um, walk to work? How, how did she live her life? It's the lives of these people um, that we're keen to show here. And the contrast between the delicacy, the small uh, single object of, the, of this one shoe, which of course shoes hold something of the, um, of the form of the owner in a way that other garments don't. It, it retains the um, size of the, of the foot. We can see, in a sense, the void of a person when we look at a shoe like this. And we can contrast it and juxtapose it with the, the strength, the power, um, the industrial process that we saw in the uh, wheel set just before. So here we speak about the victims, the perpetrator society, the victims who were targeted, the individuals whose lives were lost. Now, in terms of the perspective, of course, we don't want our visitors, we don't ask our visitors uh, to share the perspective of the perpetrators, but we do ask them to try and understand how and why these, these crimes could take place. Where did this come from? This is not an aberration from the course of European or Western society and civilization. It's a product of it. And we need to examine those flaws, those dangers, those risks. We need to try and understand and explain it as best we can. But of course, we don't ask them to share those, that perspective. We also do not ask them to share the perspective of the victim. Uh, that would be appalling. We can't do it. And even if, and if we could, uh, the horror would incapacitate our visitor. And we need them to be able to move through this exhibition and to try better to understand. So which perspective do we take? Well, you'll see in the background here on the wall um, a map. The map there is uh, actually one that we discovered in the curation of this exhibition in the uh, collection of um, a Polish man, Miroslav Genobis, living in the town of Oswinchim today. And this map is a Soviet map, a Soviet army map, uh, brought by soldiers advancing towards uh, the east, or sorry, from the east, advancing towards Berlin, but encountering Oswinchim on the way, encountering the camp of Auschwitz on the way. Their target was not there to liber liberate the camps, but they overran these camps as they proceeded. And we think that there is something in the perspective of the arrival in Auschwitz from the outside world, who knew something of the Nazi crimes, who knew something perhaps of the name of Auschwitz, who place, that places a similarity on many of our, the experience of many of our visitors who come because they know something about Auschwitz, but they don't really, most of them haven't studied it in a huge amount of depth. Uh, and there'll be much more here to discover and encounter and to try and understand. So in some sense, perhaps we're in the perspective of, the, um, of those that encounter the camp from the outside. The shoe itself is accompanied by a poem by Yiddish poet Moshe Schulstein. And this is also where I take my title for this exhibition, sorry, for this presentation, uh, Artifacts as Witness. We are the shoes. We are the last witnesses. We are shoes from grandchildren and grandfathers from Prague, Paris and Amsterdam. And because we are only made of fabric and leather and not of blood and flesh, each one of us avoided the hellfire. Each of these is very individual. Each of them is very personal, of course. Each of them is a witness to the person who owned it. And it's those people that we're trying to somehow uh, reclaim uh, to, our, to our memories, to try and understand something of who these people were, of course, before they fell victim to the Nazis and their collaborators. How do we proceed? Having set up the exhibition and said something about Auschwitz, we wanted to move back in and out of that place, Auschwitz itself, but also um, backwards and forwards in time. It was important for us to tell not only the history of the camp itself, but to take Auschwitz as a place, a place in the world. It doesn't, it's not planet Auschwitz. It doesn't just materialize out of nowhere, but an orienting point for the wider history that we want to tell this complex story. So we move from that first space, that first room, uh, 
back in time to explore the history of the pre-war life of Oswenshin. As I mentioned before, Oswenshin being the Polish name for the town which today we know as Auschwitz, the German name for that town was Auschwitz. And from there, the pre-war life of Jews and Roma, and the genocide of the Roma is also a key part of the history of Auschwitz uh, in modern Europe. We also wanted to then relate the history of Auschwitz itself to the wider history, to place Auschwitz in its context. Again, not to overemphasize the role of Auschwitz, not to make the Holocaust Auschwitz centric, but rather to understand the significant role that Auschwitz played in that wider history and how it was affected by the developing context of that time, of the rise of the Nazis after the First World War, the impact of the war, the unfolding of the Second World War itself. How, does, how do these other events impact on Auschwitz and how does Auschwitz provide a kind of thread for us to explore this complex historical and traumatic period? So going back to Oswenshin, Oswenshin, Auschwitz, or in Yiddish, Oshwitzin, uh, is this town which has centuries of history. It isn't just a place that should be associated only with the camp that, of course, dominates our popular imagination today, but it's a place where Jews and ethnic Poles and ethnic Germans lived alongside each other, um, often in harmony, often in peace, often productively, um, but of course with great tensions as well. And this is a kind of microcosm for us of some of the diverse communities that could be found throughout Europe and that set some of the context of our time. This is the town of um, Oswenshin then, which becomes Auschwitz. And on the, uh, and the site of a Polish barracks, um, the first part of Auschwitz camp. So we associate this image, of course, very much with the concentration camp, the famous Arbeitsmarkt Frei sign on the gates of uh, the first part of the camp. But even this picture needs complicating. Auschwitz uh, was not just a single site. Uh, Auschwitz, as I say, is a town, um, the German name for the town of Oswinchen. Um, but even the concentration camp wasn't a single site, but rather became a vast complex. Over the period of the Second World War, following the German invasion in 1939, this first part of the camp was established in 1940. But uh, over the course of the war, Auschwitz continued to expand its territory, its roles and its functions until it covered a vast area of some 16 square miles and some 50 or so sub camps. Three major camps, Auschwitz I, Auschwitz II, Auschwitz III, but many other smaller camps as well. So Auschwitz I, the main camp, and we see the gateway to that camp here in this more modern day photograph. Um, but after the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941, in order to receive vast numbers of Soviet prisoners of war, hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war had been taken in the first months of the, of the invasion of the Soviet Union, um, the Germans uh, constructed a couple of miles away from um, Auschwitz I, this camp, which became known as Auschwitz II Birkenau. It's uh, by the small village of um, Bajinka in German Birkenau. And uh, this vast camp was initially intended to house Soviet POW. So the expansion of the camp is very much connected to the development of the war. And in order to understand how Auschwitz develops, expands and changes its functions, we need to connect it to that wider history. So Auschwitz II, Birkenau, um, in 1942, uh, changes its function. So it doesn't remain primarily a site of Soviet POWs. Uh, that actually shifts rather early. And uh, by 1942, Auschwitz is becoming a central part of what the Germans were to call um, the final solution of the Jewish problem in Europe. Um, so what we today was called the Holocaust. This is a photograph from 1944 and the arrival of thousands of um, Hungarian men, women and children on the rampart at Auschwitz to Birkenau, uh, where they were arriving, most of them to be murdered within hours of arrival in the gas chambers and burned in the crematoria. There. So this is a different function of Auschwitz. It was not intended 
to this function when it first started. Auschwitz I, um, the main camp, and Auschwitz concentration camp in its, early, in its origins was as a place of subjugation of terror of the Polish people as part of the invasion and occupation of Poland. Um, it shifts and becomes also, and then primarily, this site of mass murder of the Jewish people here. This is a, an image drawn by one of the Zonderkommando, the um, Jewish prisoners who were forced to work inside um, the gas chambers in Crematoria just after the war. Uh, one of the survivor witnesses, David Oler, uh, showing us uh, one of the crematoria uh, that he was forced to work in. But Auschwitz throughout its, its time was also and always a place of slave labor. And this image um, is something which we use to uh, show something of the industrialized nature of genocide and also the economic aspects of genocide. So that slave labor here, um, IG Farben, the world's second largest corporation at that time, employed huge numbers of slave laborers drawn from Auschwitz III Monowitz, uh, a slave labor pool that the Nazis provided. And here again, we see some of that industrialization. So this is another function of Auschwitz, which continues throughout that period. And here, this, over, this aerial map, this aerial photograph, giving you a sense of where these um, different places are located. So here, uh, I hope you can see my cursor, Auschwitz or Zwinchim, the, the town, the city the, on the banks of the River Sola. Um, the uh, Auschwitz main camp, this was the site of the Polish army barracks, which were turned into the first concentration camp, remains the main camp in Auschwitz. Uh, the railway lines um, selections were taken place out here for most of the period of Auschwitz. But this railway spur, this railway line, uh, is extended in 1944 uh, to murder the Jews of Hungary more quickly to bring them closer to the gas chambers and the crematoria. So this is the line where the photograph I showed you of the train arrived and the people unloading, spinning out of those trains, those Hungarian Jews, uh, was in that spot there uh, on this ramp. And then uh, the vast industri industrial site of IG Farben served by Auschwitz and Monowitz over here. So, and, and many, many more um, sites of, of Auschwitz camp, the sub camps, as I say, some 50 camps during the period. So it's a, a, a hugely um, complex picture and we need to find a way through that history. And we found that by moving in and out of Auschwitz and the context of the time is a way to try and tell not only the history of Auschwitz itself, we're not trying to go from Arbeit Mark by barrack by barrack through to liberation, but rather to show the changing, developing roles of Auschwitz, its significance in that wider history, and to be able to tell much of the history of the Holocaust as well. In order to do that, as I mentioned, we go um, back in time to show something of the pre-war life of Oswentium, but also um, Jewish life in Europe and also the lives of Roma and Sinti in Europe before the Second World War. Um, and this is essential to us because we want to ensure that people um, are not appearing on the historical stage simply to be murdered in the gas chambers. We want to show something of the lives that were lived, the richness of um, those lives, of the diversity of those cultures, of who these people were. Because of course, how can you attempt to understand anything of the significance of uh, a genocide if you don't understand first what was lost. So it's important to us to introduce individuals again and to do that, um, here we see uh, a talit uh, owned by um, the gentleman in the background there, Solomon Kreiser, shown here on his engagement photograph with his future wife, Perla. Um, now, I Catan. The Talit Catan I started with appears much later in the exhibition. In order to understand the significance of that item, that object, uh, and its significance to Mendel Landau and why he was prepared to risk his life to retrieve it, we need, of course, to visit a, Many visitors won't know very much about uh, Jewish life, um, customs, religion, practices. And so in this pre-war life um, space, 
we're also able to introduce them to some of those themes. And the talit um, that you see here uh, also has those same fringes um, that you saw in the talit katan. There's a link there. Um, this is the outer garment that would be worn by an observant Jewish uh, man, and the um, talit katan would be the undergarment that might be worn. Now, why do we show this here? Well, um, Solomon Kreiser was also from Oswentium originally. He was born near Oswentium. Uh, he actually emigrated. He moved to Belgium with his wife. They had a successful uh, life there. They had two uh, daughters, um, but they were overrun also. As the uh, German army dominated Western Europe, they fled to France. They were held in an internment camp. The two, the two children, the two daughters, were actually smuggled out and managed to escape to Switzerland. But Solomon and Perla uh, remained in the camp and tragically were deported to Auschwitz, where they were murdered. So how do we have this Talit Katan, sorry, this Talit? Uh, Solomon managed to smuggle out this Talit and the last little bit of money that he had to Switzerland to his daughters before their deportation. Now, uh, um, Talit is something which is given to uh, a young a boy, a Jewish boy, as he becomes a man um, when he's 13 years old. He wears it on his wedding, so it's also the link with the engagement um, photograph you see before, and he's also buried in it, or should be. This is his burial shroud at the end of his life. The fact that we have it is also a symbol of the kind of death and the lack of dignity afforded to Solomon and to so many others. We shouldn't really have this um, talit. Uh, we have it because of the way he was um, persecuted, the way he was murdered, and the um, denial of the funeral rites that he should have been afforded. And so it becomes incredibly poignant to us and also symbolic and is part of this uh, void that we're trying to help the visitor to understand. You see how we're trying to integrate these um, personal stories as an act against the dehumanization of the Nazis and of their ideology. In Madrid, we were very fortunate to be able to borrow this um, horrific item uh, a board game from, the Ger from Germany in the 1930s called Juden Raus, Jews Out, a board game for children to play to indoctrinate them into the anti-Semitic ideology uh, that was so pre prevalent, not only in the minds of the Nazis, but of course throughout European culture, unfortunately for centuries. Um, this, these sort of hideous images uh, that are supposed to characterize Jewish people um, these kind of counters that they have as they move around the board, we need to contrast with those stories of people like um, Solomon and Perla, or through these photographs, how many photographs that were discovered um, after the war in Auschwitz-Birkenau itself. So these are some of the photographs that people brought with them to Auschwitz. These are some of the photographs. There are more than 2,000 of them that survived. Um, and almost all of them are from uh, just two uh, small towns, Sosnowiec and uh, Benzin, uh, Polish towns. But again, they're symbolic somehow of the lives and the culture and the people um, before uh, the Second World War and those who were to become uh, victims of the Holocaust. And uh, something to counter, we, we find these, um, the images that we're forced to present from the perpetrator side are so toxic, we want to try and detoxify them with the images of who these people really were. So for example, when we look at the aftermath of the First World War, and we look at the lie that uh, German was prevalent in Germany after their defeat in the Great War, uh, that somehow they'd been de uh, defeated from within, they'd been stabbed in the back, they'd been betrayed by um, Jew Jews and uh, left-wing communists who were also associated with Jewry in the minds of the, um, of the Nazis. And there's this lie that Jews had betrayed them. So we include here a photograph of uh, one of those German soldiers, um, a, a Sally Joseph in the center of that photograph with his wife and daughter, Margot. Um, Sally in 1940, he had fought for Germany in uh, the First World War. He was a Jewish man. He was one of some 70,000 Jewish men that fought for Germany in the front line, in the trenches of the war. Some uh, 
12,000 of them were killed, uh, many, many more wounded, and some 18,000, including Sally, were awarded this uh, medal, the Iron Cross Second Class, uh, for valour, for courage in, in the battle. So again, whenever we introduce a myth or a lie or a stereotype about Jewish people, because that's part of the story we have to tell, or against the, uh, the Roma or other groups, victim groups, uh, we seek as far as we can to provide the counter to that and who those people really were. Dehumanization though also happens in our minds when we're dealing with the Nazis themselves. Uh, it's very common for us to see uh, the killers as sort of monsters of our imagination. And sometimes those photographs, as we see in Auschwitz on the ramp, they can remain safely in that role for us because they're quite blank. They're kind of uh, just uniformed men uh, performing these hideous um, tasks. But here we see some of them off duty. These are SS guards uh, in Auschwitz in 1940, taken by the former tobacco uh, factory uh, in that area, uh, in an off duty moment. And somehow we see something different here, and I think perhaps more troubling. Um, so we're not, of course, when, we, when we're trying to rehumanize these um, perpetrators, it's not in any way to make them seem better. In, in many ways, I think it shows that these crimes are even more horrendous, that they were committed by what um, the historian Christopher Browning has termed ordinary men, men in uniform, but ordinary men nonetheless. How do we contextualize Auschwitz as we tell this history? I'm gonna move through fairly quickly because I'm aware of uh, time, but just to give you a sense that, again, we're not only looking at the history of Auschwitz, as I say, kind of barrack by barrack, it actually takes the visitor quite a while before they arrive properly at Auschwitz in the exhibition. And here we're looking at Germany in the 1930s and the um, concentration camp system. This is a photograph of Dachau on which uh, Auschwitz was based. So there were thousands of concentration camps and slave labor camps, prisoner of war camps, transit camps uh, in a network across German occupied Europe. But they begin on this model of the first concentration camps in Germany as early as 1933. And in a sense, Auschwitz one at least was a kind of German concentration camp in occupied Poland. Uh, it becomes later the death camp, the extermination camp of Auschwitz II Birkenau, but that's not its initial um, space, but a place of violence, of brutality, um, and the system that was used and the personnel and the, for want of a better word, the expertise of those trained in those early camps are exported across um, to the East and to uh, the German occupation zones. So the invasion of, the, of Poland from uh, the West by Germany and from the East by the Soviet Union in 1939 is of course a critical part of that uh, story, of that history, and uh, telling the story of the Second World War and its outbreak also allows us to talk about the first mass murder committed, perpetrated by the Nazis and their collaborators, which was not on Jews or on Roma, but the first mass murder was of the disabled. And it was doctors, this is a coat of a Doctor, the deputy director of uh, Hartheim Killing Center in Austria. There were six killing centers where um, people with disabilities uh, were sent. Um, some 200,000 people were ultimately murdered in these um, killing centers. Um, and uh, the, the killing of doctors, killing of patients by their doctors and nurses is this kind of Rubicon, which is Cross, the first systematic mass murder uh, by the Nazis and their accomplices. And the techniques and the methods which they used, which included um, gas chambers disguised as shower rooms, uh, were again exported further east later on in the Second World War. So many of the personnel from um, these killing centers were sent to what was known as the Action Reinhardt camps, um, Helmno, Belgetz, Sobibor, Treblinka, um, Majdanek to some extent, um, in uh, German-occupied Poland to murder the, the Jews of Poland in gas chambers as well. And again, that expertise, those te that technology, that, um, those systems were learned um, and 
used and imported to Auschwitz. So these links, these stories are all entwined. This is a sign which, uh, road sign from Auschwitz during the Second World War. So it's the renaming of Auschwitz to Auschwitz. It symbolizes for us this moment in 1939, 1940, as uh, this Polish town comes under German occupation. And this is really where we move into the first part of the concentration camp proper in Auschwitz. In the concentration camp, there were many victims um, in Auschwitz concentration camp. This is a, a German um, criminal, um, Otto Kussel, a capo is a, a prisoner functionary who many of them were as brutal as the SS guards beat and killed uh, other inmates. This particular capo, the Otto Kussel, was actually known to be very um, uh, considerate and, um, and uh, did his best for the other inmates. He actually also escaped from Auschwitz. He testified uh, his, after the war at Nuremberg. Um, but uh, Germans taken from the concentration camps to Auschwitz, in Germany to Auschwitz. Um, political prisoners, Polish political prisoners, um, Polish Jewish political prisoners in the uh, early period as well. Uh, Russian prisoners, we don't know his name, uh, we don't know his fate, same with most of the uh, Russian prisoners in Auschwitz, almost all of them perished. Uh, a woman, a Jewish woman, um, Charlotte Frank, whose sisters were murdered in the camp, she con contemplated suicide. A capo talked her out of suicide, she actually survived the war. Uh, Anna Kreutz, a Roma uh, victim, so the gypsy victim of the um, genocide of the Roma, some at least 250,000, perhaps half a million Roma and Sinti men, women and children were murdered in a genocide which was both parallel and entwined with the Shoah, the Holocaust, the genocide of the Jews. Um, there was a so-called gypsy family camp in Auschwitz some 23,000 Roman Sinti sent there. Most of them perished from appalling conditions, disease, brutality, and uh, several thousand of them murdered in gas chambers. A very small number survived. So we were very keen to tell these stories also. Charlotte Delbo, a um, prisoner from uh, France, a resistance, a member of the resistance, a writer, will return to Charlotte Delbo at the end of the presentation. So please remember her, remember her face and her name. Uh, in 1941, with this invasion of the Soviet Union, um, we had the um, Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing squads, uh, followed the German army into the Soviet Union, rounding up Jewish men, women, and children wherever they could find them and murdering them, not in gas chambers, which did not yet have been used in, in the genocide of the Jews, but um, in mass pits, people forced to dig their own graves and uh, shot, um, stripped and shot into these pits. Uh, this is taken maybe only an hour, hours or so before the murder of the men, women and children you see in this photograph. And it's a critical part of the history of the Holocaust and of course connected with the history of Auschwitz, although it's happening um, maybe hundreds of miles away. Um, it's part of the same um, project, uh, terrible word, but uh, the, the genocide that the Nazis and their collaborators were carrying out. And again, we wanted to include, we didn't want to, by focusing on Auschwitz, we didn't want to obscure um, these stories. And so this powerful moving image uh, is displayed along with these little dreidels, um, plaything of, of uh, young Jewish children found in some of those mass graves. Um, it's just a fragment of, of these lives that were lost. Certain objects, certain artifacts um, also create curatorial challenges. Uh, this is the blouse of a woman called uh, Rachel Hell Porus. Uh, given to her by her sister Haya Forus in the ghetto um, in Lithuania, German-occupied Lithuania. And uh, the embroidery that you see here was uh, done by Haya 
for her sister Rachel as a gift in the ghetto. Um, that's a powerful story in itself, right? The, the relationship, the love of sisters and the trying to continue something of a normal life, even in those horrendous conditions of the ghetto where uh, Jewish people were forced to live um, in awful, overcrowded conditions um, with very little food um, and, and great uh, spread of disease. Uh, but there's also another story connected with this, which is that Rachel was a nurse before the war and she tended the sick in the ghetto. So there's something of the kind of resistance or the resilience, the spiritual resistance of Jewish people and self-help and care for each other. That's a powerful story. Should that be the one that we tell? This, this story of the ghetto, except this blouse um, worn by Rachel Horus is also connected with the images I showed you just before of the mass shootings. Uh, the people from that ghetto were taken by train. They were told they're um, being taken to another ghetto, but actually they were taken to the forests of Ponary or Ponar. Uh, and there uh, they were forced to strip and they were shot. They were murdered in these mass graves. So Rachel becomes one of the victims of uh, the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing squads that I mentioned. And yet we still have her blouse. That's because someone who was given the grisly task, the awful task of taking care of the possessions of the dead, recognized this blouse and smuggled it back into the Vilnius ghetto where she knew uh, Rachel's sister Haya um, was at that point still surviving. And so she has, Haya has returned to her the very blouse who's the embroidery she'd done for her sister as that loving gift. And Haya wears this as she escapes from the Vilnius ghetto and she joins the partisans in the forest. She's one of 30,000 Jewish partisans fighting the Nazis from the forest. She had this blouse with her then. So is that the story which we should tell? The story of Jewish resistance and armed fighting against the Nazis. All of these stories, of course, are entwined. And the fact that she kept that in memory of her sister, of course, is also echoed by our um, ability to uh, show it in, in the exhibition and to remember her and those um, murdered peoples, the communities, the resilience, the resistance and the partisans. All of this in just one object. Uh, in 1942, December 1942, the attack on Pearl Harbor brings um, the United States into the war, um, sorry, the end of 1941. Uh, and so at the beginning of 1942, um, there is this conference in Banze where the ship are discussing the implementation of the uh, final solution of the Jews of Europe, the murder, the mass murder, um, which leads also to this uh, extension of the role of Auschwitz uh, as a central place of killing of Jewish people from all across the continent. And so we're back here with this map to the uh, railway lines and the railway wagon that we met through that wheel set in the first room and the deportations. And I mentioned to you that outside of our exhibition, too large to fit in the rooms themselves, but outside the venue is this railway wagon. This is how it was found by um, Jamal Zimiti. Um, it was purchased by Musealia, it was restored. And you can see here on the wheel, actually it's from 1940. This is the um, absolute type of railway wagon that was used to deport Jewish people, men, women and children to Auschwitz. And we see the exactly the same type of wagon in the photographs from uh, 1944 and the arrival in Auschwitz. I uh, showed you a photograph, some of this before. Those railway wagons are the same type as the one that we display outside the exhibition. And so we're back now with deportation. Um, people brought with them these belongings, of course. Most of them are anonymous, but occasionally we're able to identify an actual individual, Dr. Kurt Stein. We know he was um, a Czech uh, doctor. He and his mother were deported just days apart to Auschwitz. Both of them were murdered on arrival. We also try to set up a series of echoes and rhythms and resonance throughout the exhibition. Um, so 
again, I'm aware of time, but let me take you through quickly how some of these different objects relate and speak to each other. Going back to that first room of pre-war life, we talk about in Oswintium the story of Alphonse and Felicia um, Haberfeld and their daughter Francesca. They own the Haberfeld uh, liquor factory. These are the bottles I think you saw in one of the earlier photographs I showed as well um, that are actually sent out a, a large employer in Oswintium. Um, these bottles are exported across Europe Again, of course, on those same railway lines that later uh, would bring Jewish people into Auschwitz and to their death. So you have Auschwitz or Zwenschium going out to the world in the pre-war life um, and during the Second World War, uh, the world, the Jewish world coming into uh, its destruction in that same place. This desk is the desk that Haberfeld administered his um, office, he, his business from, um, of course, providing for his family, um, the great charit charitable works that this family gave to the local community as well. Um, Alphonse and Felicia actually survived. They happened to be in New York when war broke out, couldn't get back. Their young daughter, Francesca, uh, was left with her grandparents. They couldn't reach her. Um, and she was ultimately murdered in the death camp of Belgez. But that desk is echoed later when we reach Auschwitz concentration camp. This is the, this is the desk. Uh, which is used by uh, Rudolf Huss, the first commandant of Auschwitz, to administer his concentration camp. This is his business, is one of suffering, persecution, and ultimately mass murder, of course. But his family is also um, shown here because they live in a villa just on the edge of Auschwitz one, just meters away uh, from the gas chamber and crematoria of Auschwitz one. And here you see Huss's family, um, playing in their garden, which he uh, said in his, in his um, writings, how much his wife enjoyed their garden on the edge of Auschwitz. These links, these echoes are not necessarily made explicit, but they are deliberate that we are meeting the same kind of objects in this pretty much the same place, but of course, in very different contexts. So we're back to the shoe that I showed you at the beginning, that dress shoe, because shoes are also a motif that we return to. Um, this is a wooden clog uh, worn by prisoners in Auschwitz. Of course, their clothing was taken away from them. Um, they were stripped. Uh, Primo Levi said, death begins with the shoes because the shoes, uh, as they chafe the feet of the prisoner, slow them down, um, beatings follow, and, um, and death follows soon after. But there are also the boots of an SS officer uh, here, situated at the point of selection where people were chosen either for life or death. The vast majority of them, including the young boy who wore this small shoe and undressed in the, um, in the room, uh, told he was going to go for a shower. Um, here we see his little sock still tucked into that shoe, believing that they were going for a shower. But of course, as we know, um, the showers were fake. Um, people were murdered in those gas chambers, a gas mask and this tin of Cyclone B gas that was poured through a gas column, um, murdering the people inside. The one thing which some people still wore inside the gas ch uh, chambers uh, would be their spectacles. Um, and here, uh, one of those pairs of spectacles with a broken lens and a clouded opaque lens, symbolic of uh, the last remnants of those murdered people. Possessions which they brought with them were sorted in a place called Canada. All the things that people brought with them were seen to have some value by the Nazis. So there are thousands of these sorts of items, hairbrushes, combs, perfume bottles, uh, umbrellas, cheese graters. Um, everything had some value, of course, except for human life. And the shadows cast by these objects again, symbolic of those people that brought these objects with them and who are anonymous to us, but somehow the individuality of each of these objects would try to capture something of who those people were. The largest of the objects that we have was discovered on the site of Auschwitz III, uh, being used as a kind of storage shed, it was purchased by Musealia, restored, and this is one of the original barracks from Auschwitz 
which is a way that we can show the life inside the camps, including, of course, the appalling medical, human medical experiments, uh, life inside the camps, um, which, of course, usually ended in the death of the inmates as well, a stretcher here, which, of course, the size of it, the shape of it, is also reminiscent of the people who were carried um, from their labor, from their forced labor, from their barracks, uh, and the, the weakened the, um, uh, the, the weakened prisoners who were, were murdered in the gas chambers. So very few, it wasn't a choice of being chosen for either death or life. Even those chosen to work in the camp were worked to death. The barracks, um, this is a, a bunk from those barracks. Um, I want to end uh, with these last few objects. And um, inside the barracks, uh, one thing which you could keep warm uh, and they'll try to is these thin blankets. Um, this particular blanket was grabbed by a tailor from, a Jewish tailor from um, Austria, Siegfried Fedrid, uh, as he was forced out on the death march. Despite the degradation and the humiliation, the violence that he'd been suffering, um, this is the one thing which protects him against the freezing winter in January of 1945, as he's marched on this death march and people are perishing all around him and he huddles underneath it and um, survives. But we include it here as well because remarkably, he doesn't just save himself, but he shares this blanket with four others and um, his act of humanity is perhaps one thing which gives us some kind of hope at the end of this dreadful story. How to end then? We end with uh, a return to life. Almost everyone in this photograph and their children were murdered, either shot or killed in Belgette's death camp. The man on the right though, another uh, tailor, this one, um, Jacob Grunbaum, uh, after the war actually gets hold of bolts of um, cloth which were intended for the German Wehrmacht, the German army. And um, he turns this into a house coat, a house robe, a kind of dressing gown, um, if you like, of that kind of return to life. Um, but all of his family were murdered. He, he did marry, he had a child after him. Um, that child was one of the curators of this exhibition, Miriam Greenbaum. We also show um, the aftermath for the Roma. This is a painting by Sai Stoika. Um, after all, nothing. Uh, this is the title of this, of this work. Um, the legacy, the void, the destruction of the communities. But we try to end by showing something of um, who these people were before um, the mass murder. Uh, so this film plays at the end of the exhibition because we didn't want the last thing um, our visitors to see or to be thinking about were the uh, murdered people of Auschwitz, but rather who those people were um, before the Second World War. And again, to give us some sense of what was lost. And the last word to the survivors, this, a poem from, um, from Charlotte Delbo, who I mentioned to you before, which appears at the end of our exhibition, the last thing the visitor sees, you who are passing by, I beg you, do something, learn a dance step, something to justify your existence, something that gives you the right to be dressed in your skin, in your body hair, to learn to walk and to laugh. Because it would be too senseless after all for so many to have died while you live doing nothing with your life. Thank you so much for giving me your time um, for that just small glimpse uh, into a very large exhibition.
um, please do contact me if you're interested in continuing this conversation. I know we're out of time now. I apologize if I've overrun slightly. Um, I hope maybe one day we'll be able to bring this exhibition uh, to Australia also. Thank you so much. <laughs>